Hello, 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 wonderful class. Yesterday we were discussing integrated pest management, also known as IPM, and we were talking about the pesticide treadmill. We're going to continue our conversation regarding pesticides, and then we're going to move on to another thing that I'm very passionate about, which is fishing. So uh, there are a number of acts that you need to know for the AP exam. This one, FIFRA, aka uh, basically the Pesticide Act, and it stands for the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. And so this is going to regulate which types of insecticides or, or pesticides, rather, that we can use and what concentrations that we can use on our crops. So uh, this act is there to protect us. Uh, and I, I guess th there is constantly a uh, new innovation to develop new pesticides. And so this act is probably something that needs to be constantly updated. You would be surprised if I told you how many antibiotics are in, uh, and, and this is different, this is not pesticides. But um, I remember doing some research at NJIT, and one of the things that I was doing was trying to see if antibiotics was left in the milk um, after it's been pasteurized. And uh, we weren't able to find a particular antibiotic that I was looking for, but it turns out there's like over 300 different types of antibiotics that can possibly be used. So when you think about uh, the pesticide treadmill or the fact that superbugs do exist because they become resistant to antibiotics, this makes sense. And so more and more different antibiotics need to be developed uh, to make sure that E. coli doesn't get out in the world or a dangerous type of escherich E. coli gets out into the world. And also um, to make sure that they're effective. Uh, so anyhow, um, going off on tangents like I always do. So let's go to our next slide. And uh, we're going to talk about fishing. Okay. Excuse me, this computer's messing up. So fishing is a really cool thing. And our fisheries are under attack. Let me try to fix this computer and then it will come right back. So our fisheries are under attack. Uh, if you want to go to the presentation and you can click on that link down there or you could try to copy that URL and watch a video on our fisheries. But some project that by the year 2050, will I be alive by 2050? So that's probably going to be what, like 49 years. Oh, I, I might not be alive. Will I be alive by 2050? No, no, no. That's, not a, that's going to be a 30, about 29 years. 29 years. I think I got 29 years left of me. Where would that bring me? Roughly, roughly around 70, 69 years old. Uh, yeah, I'd probably be alive. Uh, but they say that wild caught fish may not be a lucrative job or the market or the industry that is currently at. What does that mean? Does that mean the ocean's not going to have any fish? That's going to mean that the price of wild caught fish is going to reach uh, a very high level where it's not going to be commercially available for the typical patron. Um, I don't even know if you know how much wild caught fish cost right now. When I was your age, I didn't know what my meat cost, um, and you probably don't either. But now that I am a father of three uh, <laughs> little girls that eat, uh, uh, you know, we pay attention to prices so we can make the best decisions that we can. And so there's prices of chicken, beef, and now what we try to buy is the the healthiest fish. And I'll tell you why it's considered healthiest uh, in, in a minute. Uh, which would be wild caught fish. And so that when, when a fish is wild caught, that means it's coming from the ocean. Uh, it's coming from, you know, the wild, if you will. It's not farm raised. So the difference between wild caught and farm raised is basically one is, is, is raised in the wilderness and one is going to be raised in something we call aquaculture. So what they mean by the year 2050, that the fisheries are basically going to be decimated, is that it's going to cost too much to sell the fish to make a profit for the for the fishermen and so instead they're just they're going to fold they're not going to be able to make any money so right now i believe wild caught salmon could cost something like twenty dollars a pound uh that's no lie if you look at wild caught salmon if you go to a place like whole foods and they have wild caught salmon that's going to be twenty dollars a pound 
And uh, I'm a, we have a family of five, so we probably eat about a pound and a half of meat a day. And I, please don't judge. I'm sorry. We're heavy meat eaters. Um, and so that that's pretty expensive. Uh, so uh, when you think of something like lobster, lobster can be like $8 a pound. Um, that's a lot of shell when you're eating lobster. But um, let's say chicken. Chicken can be as low as 99 cents a pound. Uh, and it could go up to $5 a pound uh, depending on the cut of meat. Uh, I know like filet mignon costs something like maybe sixteen ninety nine a pound. So a uh, wild caught salmon at twenty dollars a pound could is, is going to be more expensive than let's say a typical cut of filet mignon at a um, at, at at Shoprite or something like that. So now if that price goes higher, can you imagine how much higher can it go? Can it go to twenty five dollars? $29. Uh, Chilean sea bass I've seen for $30. Uh, there's another big fish. Uh, what is that fish? What's that fish? Uh, halibut. I've seen halibut, which is a huge type of flounder uh, that, that's typically caught in Alaska. Really want to go to Alaska, catch a halibut. Oh my God, Google that. Halibut. Um, and, and they taste um, amazing. It's like a flat type of fish. They look just like a flounder or a fluke. Uh, and, and they're delicious. But I've seen that for forty dollars a pound. So th that's going to be uh, like you know it, it, that's going to not everybody can afford forty dollars a pound. That's like first date material. You're trying to impress somebody. You're trying to you, that's like engagement dinner type type you know, spending. That's like you just won the lottery type spending. So if the average consumer can't buy that, then those companies are going to fold. And so what 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 else can you do? Well, that's why there has been technologies developing for what we call farm-raised fish, which is aquaculture, not agriculture. Aqua, agua in Spanish means water. So water farming, if you will. Okay. Now, uh, why are the fisheries are, are, are being decimated? Well, it's, it's simply as we're taking more than can reproduce. So we're taking more than can reproduce. So if this continues to happen, then there's not going to be enough fish uh, to basically repopulate the following year. I think this is a really a big problem because, you know, let's say United States, the United States sets quotas, sets permits, sets rules and regulations on how many fish that we could take out of a particular species. So let's just say, um, you know, we could only take you know, 10 tons of striped bass out of the ocean. Fine. And all the uh, citizens of the United States pay attention to that. We only take 10 tons. We only sold a couple of permits. We made a season between one month to one month and we, and we, and we followed those rules. But is every country going to follow those rules? Or maybe they, those rules are slightly different. So let's just say a country like Japan, a country like China, a country like Zimbabwe, a country like Kenya, a country like Peru, a country like Ecuador. Are these countries are going to come up with a number as well? But if they come up with a number and we come up with it's pretty much competition. You know what I mean? And how can police regulate the entire ocean when you really think about it? it it's it's impossible. We don't just have boats watching and weighing how many how many fish are being taken. And so we also don't know how, what's the reproductive capabilities of fish, how fast they will come back. Or if there was a, a catastrophic event that affected the fish population that didn't enable them to come back the following year. Uh, so let's say there was an earthquake underneath the water or a big tsunami or a lot of pollution or an oil spill or something to happen that affected all the offspring that following year. So these problems, typically, if, we, if we're just using data from the past, basically mean that our fish our fish fisheries are in decline. I don't know how to bring them back. Uh, we could set all these rules, but inevitably, even though we set these rules, if not all the countries aren't on board, then it's des it's basically leading to the demise of of uh, our fisheries. So um, <laughs> enjoy wild caught while you can. Um, if you can, uh, I uh, I want a grant to learn how to raise fish indoors, and that's why I'm such a fish enthusiast with your experiments in our in our class. Uh, you could raise fish on your own, um, and it's it's not too difficult, and it's not too high tech either. Um, 
speaking of that, I'll, I'll wait till we talk about the aquaculture slide. But uh, anyway, uh, that is our solution to that. If we if we want to continue eating fish, most likely we're going to need to farm raise our fish. Now, in addition to um, over uh, over harvesting a certain species, let's say uh, the striped bass. Um, another thing is that we often affect non-targeted species. So let's say in us hunting the, the striped bass, we're also going to, let's say, capture some sharks. We might actually ca capture some, some dolphin. We might actually capture some whales, uh, some walruses, sea turtles, all these non-targeted species. Okay. And that's, that's an issue. Okay. So not only does commercial fishing affect that targeted species, but we also affect non-targeted species. And this is a vocabulary word that's called bycatch. So bycatch is a term used to describe species that you're really not targeting, but basically end up um, in the net or end up in the, uh, in the type of fishing that you're doing. And so uh, if you ever buy tuna in the can, sometimes they say dolphin safe tuna. What does that mean? That means that the practices that they're using to catch those tuna are going to ensure the safety of, of the dolphin. Because what do dolphin eat? Dolphin are eating tuna. So wherever there's tuna, there, there should be some dolphin. And so if you cast a huge net out, and in our next slides, I'll show you how to do that. You may be capturing a couple of dolphin in there too. And so the technologies that they have... Um, I mean, what they try to do is try to release those dolphins. So as the net starts to close, um, they, they, they try to go in there. Divers sometimes go in there and try to cut the net to let, let dolphins that get entangled in there or sharks that get entangled in there, sea turtles let them out um, before the net closes. So those are some techniques that they can use, but it is difficult. And uh, dolphin do have to breathe and sea turtles also have to breathe and sharks have to constantly move. So it's a time thing. All right. It's a time thing. If they get captured in that net, uh, don't go Google crazy on this. But, um, you know, it, 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 and also let's just imagine this is like a 15 foot tiger shark. Who's going to go down there and, and, and cut the net to try to let this thing loose? It's, it's dangerous. And so, um, you know, these are some issues that are involved with wild uh, commercial fishing. All right. And finally, sometimes um, there's going to be whales and there's these huge fishing operations with big boats that have propellers. And these propellers, the whales will get close because sometimes they get caught up in the sound and uh, they end up getting hit by the propellers, which can injure these whales. This was a free response question not too long ago. So definitely know that boats are dangerous to whales because and, and we could say dolphins are whales, too, because they could get hit by the propellers. And then this could injure them and cause death or injure them. Fishing nets are also dangerous towards uh, whales and sea turtles because they can get caught up in the net and tangled and stuck and then basically not able to, to swim properly or breathe or hunt. And they eventually die of either starvation or suffocation as well. Notice I'm explaining the whole thing. Okay. Don't just say they die. They suffocate and die this is 10 times better than let's say they die. They got caught in the net, they die. They got caught in the net, they starved, and then they died due to lack of nutrition. So um, make sure we're trying to um, answer something that may be in a rubric. And of course, the adverb there would be uh, explain. So when we explain, we make sure it's a complete thought. Okay, so let's continue here. Now, what are some techniques that uh, commercial fishermen use? This is a great image if you guys want to pause and look at these images. Uh, these are all different types of ways that fishermen um, capture fish. All right. Let's go first one. And it's a, I think it's a French word, per se. I think it's actually pronounced per se. Um, and, and per se, you're going to have typically one boat or two boats or two one big boat and two speed boats. They're going to take um one part of the net and they're going to make a huge circle and then inside they'll trap in the fish they'll close off the bottom and then they'll bring the fish in now why would the fish just stay in the middle like that well sometimes you'll throw like a bait ball in the middle of the ocean and then this causes a fishing frenzy and the fish will just keep eating tuna will keep eating keep eating and now we'll send a big old net around them and capture them 
Okay. And since you threw a bait ball in there, like this is just cut up fish that the little fish are eating. Uh, sometimes there's sharks, sometimes there's other things. So that's one thing. Oh, you know what? Uh, that's how they caught. Uh, there was a documentary film, very documentary film, very educational educational purposes uh finding nemo remember at the thing at the end when they were like keep swimming keep swimming down digga, digga, digga. and 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 then they tipped the boat over well they were per se and so they closed the bottom of the net and then all those fish and they were all different types of fish they were probably going for one main fish but there was all different types of fish all those different types of fish that they weren't going for that was bycatch okay so that's per se uh and uh it, you know it's very effective very effective, uh, especially when you know the migration patterns of fish, you know what they eat, you know when they're going to be there. And those boats are so great that these fishermen could just stay out there. They stay out to sea maybe a month waiting for the fish. Uh, and then when they see them, now they react and, uh, you know, and, and, and they catch. I could tell you from personal experience, you know, uh, when striped bass come in, you need to go. They're going to be there about a week. OK, it's not like, oh, I'll just wait till I get ready. No, they're going to come and they're going to come heavy and you got a week. OK, after that, you're probably not going to catch many. They'll be sparse. OK, you will put a lot more hours in than you're catching fish. But if you catch them when they're there, you could catch. I mean, I've caught maybe 30 fish in less than an hour when, when it's hot. When it's cold, there's days that I've gone fishing and not caught anything. Um, I, I, I digress. OK, another uh, method is called gill netting. Now, gill netting, that's, I feel like it's cheating. You tell me if you think like it's cheating. That would be this bottom image here. And so let's say we had a river or we had like a migration pattern of fish. And we're basically going to take one net and we're going to pass it by. It's a long net that we're just holding. Now, uh, the good and the bad thing is that the size of the hole is going to dictate what fish can go through. So baby fish can go through. And that's good because at least you're ensuring the survival of some of the babies or some of the fish that could actually reproduce and bring back the, the, the next generations. However, uh, the next fish, let's say, is big enough, but he gets caught or she gets caught. And that's what's called gill netting. And so now that uh, that fish is caught. So all the, the, the bigger fish, the ones that get caught or the perfect size to go through the net are the ones that are going to get caught. I don't like this. I think it's cheating because there's no real fishing here. There's no real fishing. The tide is coming in. The tide is coming out. If you're in a river, that's even more cheating. You're going through the migration pattern uh, and, 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 and basically going through. And what I'm saying cheating, I mean, uh, you know, Take that with a grain of salt. Okay. Uh, you know, if you had a river and the river's just flowing one way, the fish have to go that way. So, you know, this is uh, another technique. And this is why fish populations get decimated. And I've seen horrible pictures of sea turtles caught in this gill net. I've saw whales caught in these gill nets. Uh, so really, really, really bad thing. Okay. Um, the, most, uh, the, the most devastating of all these fishing techniques, and the one I'm gonna go over now, is gonna be called bottom trawling. Say it in your head, bottom trawling. Look at over here, this is what it's called, bottom trawling. Bottom trawling is gonna be when a net basically goes down and it starts scraping the bottom of the ocean floor, and also, you know, it's part up too. So it's going to pick up usually bottom dwelling fish uh, or you scare the fish from the top. You make sure that they go down because they go down because they think it's safe there. And now you get this huge net scraping everything. Now, why is it so devastating? Well, you're scraping the bottom. Where do you think most of the eggs are going to be laid? They're basically going to be on the bottom. The clams are going to be on the bottom. The coral reefs are going to be on the bottom. All the, the, the base of the food chain pretty much going to be on the bottom. So if you destroy that, you're destroying that ecosystem, not only taking the fish, you're destroying that ecosystem as well. So bottom trolling will be the most devastating practice of all these fishing techniques. Okay. There's something called long lining. It's not written here, but it's called long lining. And that's here where you're basically going to have a very long fishing line with a bunch of hooks on it. Now, uh, this is another method that they use. You could kind of control the size of the fish by having the, sh the size of the hook. A, a small fish is not going to get caught on a very big hook. Uh, so that is one technique. However, when you're doing long lining, who is to say what you're going to catch? You know, you leave that out depending on how long and the tide's going in and tide's going out. It's not necessarily specific for a particular species. So you can capture almost anything. And so this is, this is not necessarily a great technique either. All right. And there's a final image over here. 
okay? A uh, uh, similar image down here. This is going to be fish farming in a cage. Now, fish farming could happen in a river. It could happen in, let's say, a, a bay. Um, not the greatest thing to do, and we'll talk about why it's not the greatest thing to do, but it is a technique that you could potentially use. Um, and, and imagine that. You don't even have to clean the water because the ocean is doing it for you. That kind of made sense in in one context, but not the other. Meaning you don't have to constantly do water change. You're polluting the water, but the ocean is, is cleaning it for you because you're getting new water and out and in, uh, you know, as the water comes in and the water comes out, you're changing your water. So it's different from, let's say a fish tank, because you have to manually change the water and put new water in. So that that's how it's beneficial. Is it good for the ocean? I don't think so. It's not good for the ocean because now you're concentrating of the amount of fish in a particular small area. So they're going to be producing a lot of waste similar to a CAFO. Uh, we'll talk about that in our next slide. So this would, this is what that would look like. You could do this deep sea. I don't know if it's that popular. It's deep sea aquaculture. Okay. And that's basically going to keep them lower. I would say that's, that, that's probably better for the water quality in that aspect, but um, probably more difficult because now you can't really monitor fish health without diving deep into the water. Uh, so that's going to be more sophistication, more, more machinery, more cameras, more feeders. How do you feed something that's all the way on the bottom? I don't know. Don't necessarily know how that works, but I did see some cool things online. Don't know if they're trying to develop that technology or how developed it is so far, but I definitely know they do it at the surface. All right. Now, let me change slides here. Um, I also saw this really cool technique, and it's called pole and hook. And it's 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 pretty much a bunch of guy, a bunch of fishermen and women um, on a boat. They throw a bait bucket over. They cause a fish uh, a feeding frenzy, and and there's guys with 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 poles and hooks. And the size of the hook is going to dictate what the size of the fish can bite on it. And they just throw it in and then just pushing the fish in and pushing the fish back. It's very labor intensive. It's pretty dangerous, too, because they're typically going in these rough waters. Uh, but, you know, I caught something on YouTube. Now, this is going to ensure that you're only capturing, capturing bigger fish. Let's talk about that a minute. Do you want to catch younger fish, big fish, fish in the middle? pre-reproductive or post-reproductive fish? It's a hard question. Uh, let's let's try to go through it completely though. And, 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 and let's explain some of the logic that fishermen have. It, over here in uh, Jersey, one of the fish that we can capture is a uh, fluke. And I believe this year it's 19 inches. You have to be 19 inches, 19 inches to keep. Now, what's the logic behind that? Let's say if if it was only five inches and you could keep. Well, first of all, who wants the five inch fish? It's going to be very small. You're going to have to make a big mess in your house to fillet that thing, and you're not going to get a lot of meat. And also, it's a five inch fish. It has not reproduced yet. So the logic is at least let the let them be 19 inches before you keep them. So if they're 10 inches, 11 inches, 12 inches, that they're going to reproduce previously to you taking them out of the uh out of the ocean out of out of wherever they're they're being captured so that that is something called size limits now there are some other people that have thought this through and there's actually a minimum size that you can you can't keep so th there's you know you have to be at least this big however if you're Bigger than this, let's say if you're 42 inches, and let's look, I think it's striped bass. If you're bigger than 42 inches, you can't keep it either. Now, what's the logic? You had to be between, I believe, 26 and 42. So if you are smaller than 26, you're not in reproductive age. If you're at 26, um, then, then, then it's safe enough to keep. But if you're at over 42 inches, then that means you're a big fish. You're an older fish. You're a smart fish. You're a wise fish. You're a fish that has a huge belly that can reproduce a lot. All right. So a young female versus an older female, there's a big significant size difference in the, and, and a difference in the amount of eggs that the female fish can carry. So if you're over than 42 inches, take your picture really quick and weigh the fish, but throw that fish back in very gently so we can survive and pass on to the next generation. Does that make sense? I hope it does. All right. And I, I think this was a, a Native American 
I, I saw it on Discovery, so I don't know, uh, an old Native American practice that they were harvesting some freshwater clams from a river. And one dude harvested everything he could. He saw a, a clam, he grabbed it. It was a baby clam, he grabbed it. It was a medium clam, he grabbed it. There was an older clam, he grabbed it. And um, when he brought it back, and because everybody was starving, uh, and I think the, the chief or the leader of the pack at that particular point was there, uh, the, the chief you know, reprimanded him because he was like, why'd you take these youngins? Who's going to reproduce for the next generation? You should have left them there. Point taken. Then he goes, why'd you take these older ones, these huge ones? These are great breeders. They're the experienced ones. They would have left more um, eggs for the future generation as well. So it was like, whoa, you should have took the ones that were at that right size for harvesting. All right. Put that in your mind. It's a good thing to consider. Um, even if you're hunting, what do you really want to hunt? Do you want to hunt a trophy? Do you want to hunt a young? you want to hunt one in the middle? It's weird. Um, ask a lion. Ask a lion what they hunt. You know, I don't think they hunt like the alphas. I don't think they hunt th the biggest, toughest one. I, sometimes they, I think that the lion is looking at him and trying to find one that has asthma. You know, he's like, which one has asthma so I don't have to run too much? You know, what I mean? which one has a cold so I can, so I can run up on this one? Which one has like a broken leg so I can kill it very easily? All right. I'll take that with a grain of salt. All right. Let's keep going. All right. This is just a better picture of those fishing techniques that I was talking about. And uh, this is going to try to pay attention to this topic. It's it's a pretty cool topic. It's called maximum sustainable yield. Maximum sustainable yield, also known as MSY. MSY. All right. I'm going to move my picture out here. Now, um, well, how can we ensure that our fisheries will remain as as productive as they possibly can? So this might be like a, a laundry list of a free response question that you may see. Uh, and this could deal with not just fisheries, but let's say wildlife in, in, in nature. You can sell quotas. All right, or set quotas, sorry, set quotas. So you could only take 10 tons. You could only kill 500 bears. You could only kill 1,000 white-tailed deers. All right, set a quota. Anything over than that, you, you can't, and the park ranger is going to get you, okay? Or you can sell permits. So uh, let's say I want to kill a deer. Well, I have to go buy a permit. And the people that are running the permits, they're going to sell a number of permits. And those permits are here. You have permission to kill two deer. And so maybe that permit just dictates how many you're going to take, all right? You can have a specific season, and that season will be from, let's say, March to April. That's it. You have to give the time for that species to come back, okay? But you can take them now or hunt them now, um, but then you have to leave them alone. And that's why we do have seasons, okay? Um, and then the other thing is, well, how, how many can we take? Right. Remember how I was talking about over harvesting? Well, what is the specific number of a species that we could take to ensure the survival of that species, but also to ensure that we're maximizing the amount of profit that we can get from getting that species? And that's going to be called MSY, a.k.a. the maximum sustainable yield, which is 50 percent of carrying capacity. OK, so it's like um, in this image over here. Um, Here's carrying capacity, and let's just say it's 100 tons. Well, how many fish should we take? We should take 50 tons. Well, why don't we only take 25 tons? 25 tons, and they'll come back. Well, you know what? If we took 25 tons, the following year, they're still going to uh, produce only 100 tons. The 100 tons is the carrying capacity. So if we only took 25 one year, we'd actually be losing some profit there. Why? Because there is going to be, if we, if we left 75% of that population, there's still significant um, uh, competition, intrinsic, intra-specific competition with that species. So growth isn't just crazy. You know, they still compete. When you take 50% of that uh, population, then the uh, intraspecific competition slows down a little bit, which then increases the growth of that population. So 
uh, scientists have worked out, mathematicians have worked out, it's typically 50% of carrying capacity, which would be that maximum number, which then you could harvest that will come back to following you. Okay. Um, I have some random information here. CITES, all right, uh, the Convention on International Trade of Endangered Species, if we remember that, aka CITES, enlisted the great white shark in 2002. It is now protected, so even though it does swim off our Jersey Shore, we have to leave it alone. All right, you're in excellent class. Have a beautiful day. Enjoy the sun.